him as well. And thank you so much for coming. And Stu, you may have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Diane and okay. Marilyn. I leave you. Thank you, Bye. everybody, for coming. And it would be a big help if everybody does mute themselves so that background noise uh, is at a minimum. Uh, we, we'll be talking today about Russia and China. And uh, at the end, I will leave plenty of time. I, I'll talk for about an hour or thereabouts, and I will. Uh, leave plenty of time for questions at the end. You may have some. You may figure that I don't know what I'm talking about, so you may not have any questions. And Paul already knows the answers, so he won't have any questions, I know that. Um, but we've had, within the last year, both uh, oh. Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping uh, made errors that somewhat damaged their personal uh, authority and uh, also their country. In the case of Putin, he, uh, we all know that he was dealing with the uh, invasion of Ukraine, which has turned out to be somewhat different than he had anticipated. In the case of Xi Jinping, uh, he overstayed the uh, severe COVID zero COVID lockdown in order to get himself uh, nominated for another term by the, uh, by the party. And then uh, when he unexpectedly lifted the lockdown, the, uh, you know, the country was not prepared and the virus spread throughout the country. Chinese who don't usually have very good figures have already admitted that 80% of the people in the country caught the virus, and uh, they are admitting to 80,000 deaths, but they've changed how they record deaths and everything. So most people who uh, who know something about how the thing's going in China would say that the at least a million people uh, have died in China from the virus. So that two events, which has have uh, dented somewhat the authority of uh, these authoritarian figures and in the process have uh, hurt their countries uh, in, in various ways and for various, and we don't know how long that will last, but I will go through uh, both of them, starting with Russia. Now, those of you who've been in my classes before will be familiar with the history of, uh, of Putin's viewpoint on Russia. And I think that regardless of whether we agree or disagree, it's very much worthwhile thinking of things through the lens of Putin's Russia. Starting back in 2007, he began to, to tell the world uh, how he felt about uh, the advancement of NATO and EU towards his borders. And then uh, eventually about the stationing of uh, missile, anti-missile devices in Poland, which were allegedly uh, to fend off any launches from uh, missiles from Iran towards the EU. It, kind of complicated things that Iran at the time didn't have any missiles that could reach the EU. Uh, so Putin regarded that stationing of the missiles plus the advancement of NATO as a threat to Russia's sovereignty. He started, he made a, a long speech about it in 2007. In 2008, he met with uh, our president, George W. Bush and uh, Condoleezza Rice and told them uh, how he felt about uh, the ad advancement of NATO and the, how he regarded Belarus, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, and Kazakhstan as his absolutely untouchable uh, buffer zone countries uh, in, in, in effect his red line. And he told uh, 
explicitly told President George W. Bush that if Ukraine went into NATO or the EU, they would go, it would go in without Crimea and the Eastern provinces. This was 2008, and then we had the Georgian, uh, the, the, uh, the, the war in Georgia, and, uh, and we had the, uh, the Maidan revolution in 2014 in Ukraine. And uh, each time, and particularly in the Maidan revolution, uh, we sent, uh, by that time it was uh, President Obama and Putin kept reiterating his views and even wrote a big essay on, on his views and published it in the international press about how Russia felt threatened uh, by these advancing. We sent uh, people to uh, support the, uh, John Kerry led the de de uh, delegation and uh, Baroness Ashton led, uh, who was the foreign minister of the EU at the time, led the delegation from the EU, who supported the revolutionaries in the, in the Maidan in 2014. So it was definitely, um, feeling that the U.S. and NATO were supporting an invasion of uh, his stated buffer zone. Uh, and so then Putin moved and took over Crimea and part of the eastern provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk, as he had said he would do. And there was very, there was almost no response from the West. There were some sanctions, but thus far the sanctions have not been able to deter Russia at all. So he, he not only saw this encroaching, but he saw that his move, which he had telegraphed many times up until that point, uh, basically be unopposed. So when this rolled around a year ago, uh, Putin decided that this was the time to, to make his move. He and Xi Jinping have operated under the uh, belief that the West and the US in particular were in a decline and therefore vulnerable. And he anticipated and his planning for the invasion of Ukraine was based on the fact that he expected uh, nothing really to be done and have very little opposition, and then he would have the Russian-speaking uh, portion of Ukraine, which was basically on the uh, eastern side of the Dnipro River, would be would welcome him with open arms. Well, we saw what happened, uh, and uh, his army was uh, his whole military was much less prepared than anybody envisioned, including himself and his um, and his leaders, um, Defense Minister Shoigu and, uh, and uh, General Gerasimov, who was head of the uh, general staff. The training had been slipshod. They had maybe 40,000 troops that were really well-equipped and well-trained. The rest of the army was dealing with shoddy equipment, poor training, and uh, were manned by conscripts. So we saw the uh, the Russian army get chewed up uh, in the uh, in their advance, and in fact got pushed back um, as uh, the Ukrainians were able to gather steam and they pushed them back so that um, we're in, in where the position is now that uh, they the Ukrainians have taken back some of. Uh, the of the house. Zaporizhia that was uh, declared a part of Russia and a part of the uh, of Luhansk, they haven't really taken back much of Donetsk yet. Uh, so that's where we are. We've got a somewhat of a stalemate taking place in the in the east, mm -hmm. and there's threatened uh, offensives both by Russia and by Ukraine. But Russia is, when they claim that, and as Putin did in his speech uh, 
this, this most recent speech today, he claimed that he was attacked, that he was provoked by the West. He's operating on this historical note that uh, he has viewed the advance of NATO uh, as a provocation. He also, has, of course, has said that uh, the disbanding of the Soviet Union was one of the greatest tragedies in history. So he's <clears throat> wanting to restore Russian power and respect in the world, which uh, the West has not been willing to give him. In fact, President Obama called him a minor regional uh, uh, leader, which greatly offended Putin. So he's launched this invasion. Uh, if you remember World War II, uh, the, the initial advance of the Germans chewed up the Russian army and it wasn't until the second uh, group of uh, troops were trained uh, out in uh, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and were unleashed and came back starting with Stalingrad to uh, push the Germans back and retake all the territory. That is basically what uh, Putin is counting on now. He looks at uh, the West being basically divided. He looks at their patience being uh, being short. He looks at uh, the, the possibility that he can recreate uh, an army and recreate a, an offensive that will, over time, uh, reclaim what uh, he wants in, in Ukraine, which he stated was the Donbass. But actually, I mean, he wants to crush the country and, uh, and subjugate it and have it run by a puppet government, as you can see. You know, so we're fighting this war, which is a, a, a very strange war in that uh, we're dribbling out a, equipment to the, the Ukrainians to, uh, to fend off the Russians. But at the same time, uh, we will not permit them to have any equipment that could attack the Russians in Russia. So the Russians can send missiles and artillery and send everything into and into Ukraine, destroy civilians, destroy houses and hospitals and schools and the electricity grid and the water with impunity because they, they can't be uh, attacked. Uh, by any weapons that Ukraine has at the moment. So we're, it's a very strange war that is being fought. Uh, and Putin, as he always does when he's challenged or when he's got difficulties, has doubled down, tripled down on his stance and refusing to uh, in any way uh, back off his attempts to to take Ukraine or to justify his, his attack on the basis of that Russia was provoked by the West. And basically what Russia is doing is they are fighting the West. They are fighting NATO and the West led by the United States. They're running disinformation. Uh, they're running uh, disruptive activities in uh, Moldova and uh, in Serbia at the moment. They're running in both, which uh, they're trying to upset governments that were basically pro Western. They, uh, they orchestrated the burning of the Quran in, uh, in front of the Russian and the Turkish embassy in Sweden, which caused uh, the the Turkish government led by Erdogan to back off of uh, allowing the Swedes to into NATO. So he's conducting his usual type of disruptive activities and he's playing for time, believing that time is on his side. On the other hand, we have our president who, who paid a secret visit to, to Kiev yesterday and that was a great PR move. Zelensky felt very good about it. Uh, did it accomplish anything? Uh, not really. Uh, 
were making statements that, uh, well, which kind of offend me every time I hear them because uh, we talk about we're we're going we're here for as long as it takes. Well, what does that actually mean? The word it. What does it mean? Does that does it mean we're with you until you take back every inch of uh, Ukrainian territory from the Russians, which is what the Ukrainians think it, they want? Does it mean it uh, until we get to a point where we can have a ceasefire, which is what many of the Europeans want, and some members of our Congress? Uh, he also said uh, here, uh, in the speech that he gave this morning, he's going to be steadfast behind uh, Ukraine. But what does that mean? Uh, we does the, the president has used the defense budget, which is already approved. So he's used monies that are in the defense budget to pay for weapon systems that he's been sending to Europe, which he can do. Uh, because the money is already approved by Congress. But uh, we have another budget coming up. So any further aid, uh, further monies are going to have to be appropriated and uh, approved by Congress and by our Congress. And the situation is quite different now. Uh, you had the the Republican Freedom Caucus make a statement uh, just yesterday that they are not, they will not allow um, blanket approval of uh, funds to Ukraine. We have some of the same statements coming from the far left with the Progressive Caucus. So whether Biden can actually deliver on on these promises of as long as it takes or steadfast or whatever it is that uh, we are letting the the Ukrainians and, and now the Poles and others believe that uh, it's going to be our policy. We don't, whether he can deliver on that or not, we have to remember that the debt limit hasn't even been agreed upon yet. Uh, so financial situation is is up in the air. And there are more fractures in the uh, effort to support Ukraine than, than many people uh, are willing to recognize. In this country, fractures are beginning to appear. I mentioned a couple of them. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, the British uh, the BBC's uh, European editor, Katja Adler, went around and toured European countries and made a report of, of her tour the other day. And while the governments, by and large, are adhering to the statements that they've made, uh, the, the people in a number of countries, the popular will in a number of countries, is uh, increasingly against the war in Ukraine. Uh, in in Italy, for example, we have a right wing government that had opposed the war, and uh, about fifty eight percent of the population is uh, is non enthusiastic about the war. In Hungary, in Serbia, in uh, in in Greece, you have uh, majorities of the population being, uh, if not pro Russian, uh, at least not anti Russian, uh, and. You have uh, the same thing that's happening with strong right-wing populist movements in Germany, the uh, uh, alternative for Deutschland uh, party in Germany is very strongly against the war. And then globally, uh, right after the invasion, the, the, uh, in the UN, the uh, proposal was introduced to censure Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. Well, it, it did pass, but countries that uh, represented over half of the world's population either voted against or abstained uh, of, from that vote. That, those included Brazil, India, and Israel, uh, three countries that uh, 
uh, you wouldn't have expected necessarily uh, would would have done that. So it's far from solid the approach, uh, the support for uh, Ukraine, and we'll see. But it, it's unlikely that uh, as we go along that it's going to get any stronger. And we'll see how if there if if more fractures appear. Now the Chinese have entered the equation, and we'll talk a little more about China. But the uh, Chinese have entered the equation by making a very strong statement. Uh, their foreign minister is uh, touring uh, at Europe, and he's also visiting with uh, the Russians. And he said uh, their policy is that they're firmly against any nuclear war which is good, but uh, they, the Chinese are virtually certain to present a peace plan. He announced that they would present a peace plan. It's virtually certain that they will have a peace plan on the table, uh, not too distant future, which calls for negotiation. They're saying we, it should be, this is, it should be negotiated. People should come to the table and start talking. Now, the Chinese peace plan, which they're firmly behind the Russians because they want to, uh, they're uh, trying to reduce the power of the West as well. But so it will almost certainly include the type of territorial condition that the Ukrainians will oppose very strongly. What exactly, what uh, conditions they will, um, they will uh, include. We don't know yet, but they will put a peace plan, and so it'll be out there. Their peace plan will be out there, calling for negotiation, calling for a negotiated settlement, uh, and, and that will require things that the Ukrainians will be very much opposed to. Are we going to, how are we going to react to that? That will be an important PR move in world opinion, who most people want to see, most of the people in the world want to see the possibility of escalation of this conflict re reduced and that uh, that they would like to see um, some kind of negotiated settlement that would bring back the, the possibility of trading with Russia and and Ukraine and, and remove the possibility of, of further uh, military problems. So that will be on the table. The Chinese have also, we stated that we were concerned that the Chinese would start to supply weapons or materiel to the Russians. President Biden stated that in his speech uh, a couple of days ago, uh, Secretary of State Blinken and uh, Secretary Austin have both talked about that possibility. That would be a game changer because one of the things that the Russians uh, have a, a real shortage of is computer chips. They're finding in the missiles that they detect and open up uh, on the battlefield after they've been shot down. Uh, they find that they are using uh, computer chips from washing machines and refrigerators and various other things uh, in uh, because they they don't have access to the sophisticated chips that they used to to put in their weapons. Quite honestly, their weapons and their, uh, their tanks, their aircraft, their artillery, everything were loaded with chips that came from us. Now that we've made it impossible to send chips into Russia, uh, they're struggling. They're also struggling with uh, to get ammunition and spare tanks and things of this nature, all of which, uh, should the Chinese decide to start supplying them weapons, would be a major change in the whole situation. The Chinese have not threatened to do it. We have said that uh, we're afraid that they we've discovered some in, indications that uh, the Chinese may start doing this. Um, but all we know from 
absolute certainty I, is that the Chinese will have a peace plan that will be on the table very shortly. The sanctions that we thought was going to, were going to slow down the Russian economy, the forecasts when the sanctions were imposed a year ago and uh, since then was that the Russian economy would uh, go down by about 20% in, 2000, uh, in 2022. It actually declined a little bit over 4%. So the sanctions are biting far less than we had originally uh, anticipate and the China. So the Russian ability to fund the war and to keep their economy going has not deteriorated to the extent that uh, we had thought that it that would happen. Now we are one of our our theories behind all of this was you put sanctions. The people start suffering, the people start objecting to the uh, leadership, and, and we can see a regime change. Well, the people who objected to the, the, the way the Putin's government was acting in terms of the invasion, basically what they did was they left about 200,000 of the and, and it is going to have a long-term impact on their economy because uh, the young uh, IT workers who have been one of the heart of the Russian industry uh, left there in Turkey, they're in Kazakhstan, they're in Georgia, they're in, some of them are in, in other places in Europe. And so that, that has been a problem. But as far as unrest, Putin has a very tight control over his security services, and they have kept the population in line. I mean, a young woman they just recently was on, they showed pictures of her being on, in one of those cages being tried. She posted some fairly mild objection to the war on, on um, their equivalent of Facebook. She was uh, arrested. And she has been sentenced to eight years in in prison. So that crackdown is significant. Where the unrest that is threatening the Putin regime is coming from is from the right. Uh, if you have been following what uh, that uh, Vigeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, has been saying, and also uh, runs in. Uh, Kadirev, who's the head of Chechnya, that has his own, he has his own militia as well. Both of them have been saying that the war is not being pursued vigorously enough, that the, the military is incompetent, uh, that uh, in, uh. directly said that Putin is incompetent, but they're implying that. And the people who think that the war is being, not being, pursued in a, in a uh, aggressively enough. That is where the unrest is coming from. So if you were to have a regime, regime change within the relatively near future, it would be, it wouldn't be a, uh, a regime that was headed by Alexei Navalny, who's in jail. It would be uh, a regime that was uh, centered around these people who don't believe that the war is being pursued in a lackluster manner and not aggressive enough. Uh, so it would be someone that's exactly opposite of what we would want to see. Uh, and that is, <clears throat> Putin is still in a pretty solid position, but uh, that does remain a certain level of unrest. And we don't know to what degree... Prigozhin has been mouthing off uh, on an almost daily basis. Uh, whether he is a, an actual threat or whether he's uh, a big mouth that is being somewhat sidelined, we don't really know. Uh, he's attacked the military, particularly uh, Shoigu, the defense minister, and uh, 
Gerasimov, the head of the, the chief of staff of the army, who have both have been sent down to uh, to pursue the war in person rather than uh, sitting up in Moscow. So that's a possibility, but it's not uh, it's not sure, and it's not going to be anything that makes the situation more amenable uh, to settlement or to uh, to our viewpoint. Let's look at Xi Jinping for a moment. Uh, when I've talked about China in the past, uh, I've mentioned that, uh, and, and I think the title of the last class that I did on China was uh, powerful but uh, fragile. Their vulner one of their vulnerabilities is that all of the power has been centralized in uh, in the Communist Party and in Xi Jinping himself. So it used to be that there was a fairly big private industry, a lot of uh, companies that were coming along and, and creating entrepreneurial successes like uh, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, and uh, ByteDance, Jones Titcock. But part of the crackdown, supposedly uh, to eliminate corruption, uh, Xi Jinping has gone after the heads of a lot of these private companies to try to bring them under the thumb of the party. And, and whether that, uh, and it seems that that may be restricting their entrepreneurial enthusiasm, creating less growth opportunities than existed before. All the growth, all the economy, all the future is being centered in the party and in what is called the state-owned enterprises, which are, are now taking uh, stockhold, uh, small stockholder positions in all of the big uh, private companies. Small in, in percentage, but they're on the board and they're, con they're moving into control of a lot of these companies that they don't want any power center to arise that is different from the party and from uh, Xi Jinping himself. So as the COVID, zero COVID policy was going along uh, and it was proven to be both very destructive to the economy and uh, created social unrest, uh, Xi Jinping uh, began to uh, realized that his that, that things were getting a little bit out of control as far as he was concerned. And they ended after he got nominated for this third term, he ended the uh, zero COVID almost immediately. And then tr he's trying to revive the economy. He's loosening up a little bit on some of the strictures that uh, he was putting on private industry, although they just arrested a uh, uh, a major player and a uh, billionaire person uh, last week. And that question is uh, how serious they are in, in turning over more control to the private sector. But uh, he realizes that economic growth is key to his power and to the power of China, and they're trying to restart the economy but as we look out we have uh, china being uh, demographically challenged because the population actually declined last year for the first time in recorded history uh and uh it so it, it's aging uh, they are not able to get uh a, people that have more children trying to reverse the uh one one child policy that is not proven to be successful. So they're looking at an aging uh, population, which which has less workers uh, to help the economy, and they also are in uh, very significant climate challenges from the standpoint of of fresh water, standpoint of rising seas, standpoint of drought an intense storm, 
and it's going to so that's going to be a big drain on uh, the uh, their bank accounts they're very heavily borrowed uh, dealing with their climatological problems which may be more serious than ours frankly so we say i said in the in the introduction to this class is have they has putin and and she passed their peak it does to me look like putin uh, may well have certainly taken a step past his peak and is in some kind of a decline china itself looks like it has passed its geopolitical peak i know that's kind of a controversial statement but uh and and she goes along with that uh, his his power is going to uh dissipate as china's is as well now china's decline is not likely to be as steep as russia but now we've entered into a period where if china sees itself unable to grow the way it has been in the past and uh facing demographic and climatological problems you would think that might be regarded as good news in the west but it's actually not good news at all because that is when a nation becomes more dangerous when they realize that they have to start making some moves in order to uh, recalibrate the center stage and xi jinping is certainly going to focus on nationalism uh, to divert attention from some of these internal problems that I just got to be discussing. And one of those um, absolute uh, national interest red lines that he stated is control of the Western Pacific. The U.S. is considered that for certainly since World War II, that we are uh, the, the nation that patrols and, control and controls the Western Pacific. By that, I mean the starting with the South China Sea, moving up through the Straits of Taiwan, uh, into the East China Sea, and going up towards uh, uh, Korea and the Strait between Korea and Japan. Uh, China views that as its home waters, much the way we view uh, the Caribbean uh, our, since the time of uh, James Monroe, as Secretary of State, and the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and they are have, have created a military force that is oriented towards uh, making sure that their dominance over the Western Pacific is uh, is enhanced and uh, and effective. They have uh, huge uh, armaments along their coast of. Uh, anti-ship missiles and and uh, and anti-aircraft batteries they have uh, created the largest navy in the world larger in terms of number of vessels and in terms of uh, tonnage total tonnage more than ours uh, they have uh, they've even started to build carrier battle groups we have that has been the backbone of our naval outreach. But as far as the defense of the Western Pacific is concerned, the Chinese coast, uh, their, and, their, and their submarine fleet uh, and, their, and their shore battery and all are specifically uh, oriented to take out carrier battle groups. So, It is going to be, and, and about twice a year, for the past 20 years, they've fought. Uh, Rand Corp has run a, uh, uh, maneuvers on, in a computerized maneuvers where our forces fight the Chinese. They, they bring in all the generals and everything. They assign them, uh, roles. And they fight, uh, battles. Um, they create battles to be fought. And in uh, the last 20 years, the side that's been playing China has won all but two of them. 
So if we decide that we are going to uh, militarily support Taiwan, we are going to militarily make sure that the South China Sea is uh, is open and that we control the access and egress from it. There is going then there will be for sure a clash and the clash will be extremely uh, expensive for both sides. But uh, we will be we will take some very big losses defending Taiwan or, uh, or, or defending the South China Sea and even uh, keeping um, the Japanese, the, the waters around Japan open. And the Chinese have, have, have moved into, we saw there uh, recently, we've seen their uh, balloon fleet uh, and it, it's part of their near space program. They've uh, developed much more capability than we have thus far in in fighting in outer space, uh, whether it's with their balloon fleet, which they've launched, uh, they've been practicing launching uh, hypersonic missiles from their from their balloons, as well as uh, conducting surveillance. Uh, they have high-powered lasers, which can shoot down satellites. So they're, you know, the we were forewarned for 20 years uh, about what China, what Russia considered to be their absolute uh, best and uh, vital national interests. We essentially uh, ignored them or didn't take them terribly seriously. And here we are involved in a fight in Ukraine. We have uh, depleted our reserve stocks of weaponry. Uh, to supply Ukraine. We are trying to up production of uh, ammunition and various other uh, weapon systems to uh, refill the... Somebody has got background, please. Uh, please, uh, please, 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 uh, please mute yourself. Anyway, so we're we're trying to up our military production, but it's that takes a long time since we're not on uh, wartime footing. We've been on peacetime footing, uh, and I don't know how long it's going to be before we were capable of of conducting any kind of a conflict with China. We're, we're having enough trouble supporting Ukraine. Uh, the, the Chinese are very who are trying to set up their own economic and uh, financial system to compete with ours to avoid. I don't know what's going on with background. I think Norman. I see uh, it's. Somebody is, somebody is, is yeah. one guy oh. that showed up was Murphy, uh, Barbara Murphy, and uh, Norman. Oh, it's not muted, please mute, because you're doing a cross noise. Anyway, we, <clears throat> the. Okay, it stops. If so we on. ignore what China has claimed are their absolute red line. And what they are going to, what they want to have as their uh, objective in, in the Western Pacific, and, and secondary objective in the Himalayas. Uh, and if we ignore that uh, and uh, and continue to arm uh, Taiwan uh, and continue to patrol, send our patrols through the Taiwan Strait and the South China Sea, then <clears throat> we were in the very significant risk of ending up in a conflict with China. I don't know if we have, uh, if we feel that we're ready for that. Uh, have we planned on that? Do we, have we uh, developed uh, our strategy and our armaments uh, to deal with uh, something of that nature? I don't know, but I have a suspicion since most of the military people are saying, be careful, I mean, because, we're not convinced we can beat China. 
uh, most of the politicians are getting up there and uh, making very provocative statements and making trips to Taiwan. We have a group of, uh, of Congress people there at this moment. And uh, look, Kevin McCarthy is supposedly going to be going in April. Um, all of these are considered by the Chinese to be extremely provocative. I don't know if we're ready for uh, to back up what what we're saying, but we're heading down a very dangerous path, particularly since uh, militarily uh, we're up to our eyeballs in uh, trying to deal with the situation in Ukraine. Uh, so I think Xi Jinping is. Although he took uh, uh, some heat internally for his stance on COVID uh, and on the economy, I think he's pretty secure in terms of uh, being in control of, of the country and of the party. He's lost a little prestige, he's lost a little influence, but I think that uh, by and large, he's in a lot better shape than Excuse me, uh, than Putin is. But uh, what worries me is that our politicians are talking about things that I'm not convinced they know how to back up, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's China. And make no mistake, the Chinese are backing and will back the Russians 100%. If you if you listen to the rhetoric in China, read the stuff that, that is circulated there, they are uh, fully behind the Russians. Now, do they want to have a nuclear war? No. Would they prefer to have some kind of a settlement which would, which would reduce the hostilities in, uh, in the Ukraine? Yes. But any ch chance of us assuming that for some reason we can pry them apart, uh, I think at this moment is, uh, is fanciful. Long term, as, as I've mentioned in some of my classes, I consider that long term, um, before mid century maybe, uh, China will end up occupying, uh, Eastern Siberia. Uh, they will have, uh, they will have settlements there. They will have factories there. They're already moving in. Uh, but that, as the climate changes and moves northward, uh, I think uh, the Chinese will be moving into eastern Siberia, uh, not the Russians. But that's that's something for the future, as is any conflict that might occur in, in Central Asia. Right now, the Chinese are going to bring out this peace plan, plunk that on the table, trumpet themselves as being the adults in the room, the people who want peace and not war, uh, and will put out some kind of a plan that is going to be uh, very difficult to deny, uh, but will contain elements that uh, Ukraine will find uh, extremely objectionable. So I don't know how we plan to deal with that, but that, that is, in my mind, a certainty. That's happening. Uh, and the Chinese have already said that's what they're going to do. So uh, I think the best thing to do now, is I've talked about an hour, and uh, I would be very happy to, before making any other statements of things, to take your questions or comments, if you have any. I don't know. Uh, I, if I can see everybody, I don't know if Diane or, or Marilyn can see better than I can, but uh, I'd be glad to look. If I see people's hands waving or, or one of those hands coming up on the screen, I would be happy to. Oh, Steve. Yes. Yeah, yes. Oh, Steve. Uh, most of the uh, people at the Pentagon think we should be going all out. Uh, in the Ukraine war to uh, and take Crimea and everything back. Um, and they're upset that we're not uh, going full speed ahead. 
I, I understand that. Uh, my initial reaction uh, when this whole thing started a year ago was that I would have taken the 82nd Airborne Division and maybe the 101st Airborne Division and put them in Ukraine and said, well, you guys, uh, you come in here, uh, we're going to go, we're going to go after you. Uh, I don't understand. You don't treat Putin with kid gloves. You punch him in the nose. Uh, uh, you have to risk uh, nuclear conflict. I would agree with that. Uh, you can't have fighting a war where the Russians can level every city in Ukraine and you and the Ukrainians can't shoot back. Uh, that makes no sense to me at all. So uh, I come down on the, on the side of the Pentagon uh, and that view that you just articulated, but that is not the view that is being articulated by our government or our Congress. Uh, they may be ready to go to battle with China, but they don't at all seem to be ready. In fact, we have uh, a whole segment of the population that is pretty much pro-Russia, -pro if any of you have been listening to Dr. Carlson and his followers. Is it on? Uh, anyway, uh, is it you? Suzanne? Thank you for that. Suzanne Adamson, you have your hand yeah, up. I have, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, I remember in 2014, uh, Obama wanted to send in troops, uh, and Angela Merkel said no. Do you think if they had sent in troops, then that would, would be in a different situation? Uh, and two, uh, I know there have been some um, journalists in the press have been saying that if uh, Russia ends up winning the war against Ukraine and takes the whole Ukraine with the backing of China, Northern Europe, like especially Sweden, that doesn't seem like it's entering NATO anytime soon, that there will be tanks rolling in Stockholm. What do you think about that? <clears throat> well... First of all, uh, if Obama had sent troops to Ukraine in 2014 uh, to stop the little green men in Crimea and uh, and Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, certainly things would have been different. Uh, we might have had a conflagration then, uh, but that is, you know, if Robert E. Lee uh, coming uh, had, had uh, taken command of the America, the uh, the national forces instead of the Confederates in 1861, that would the Civil War would have been different too. Uh, so that's in the past. As far as uh, I would doubt that the Chinese are very careful. Uh, I don't think that the Chinese are going to back Russia to attack NATO. Now they might back them so that they can, can re retain their position in, uh, in, in you, the part of Ukraine that they're controlling now. But I think they're, they're, very, they're fairly conservative and fairly cautious. So I don't think they would push for uh, a, a conflict with NATO. And if you saw the way the Russian uh, military has been performing in Ukraine, uh, they, they would, if if they went up against NATO, they would have to have a fairly substantial Chinese backing in order to do that. Uh, now, if but if if they did uh, in your scenario, uh, the the tanks would not be rolling to Stockholm first. The tanks would be rolling to Estonia. Uh, they would be in Al Tallinn. Uh, they would be closing the gap uh, that exists. Uh, the corridor that exists between uh, uh, Poland and Lithuania to Kaliningrad. Uh, that is where the Russians would go first. Uh, eventually, with the, and they might end up in Stockholm, but uh, were any uh, Nordic country to be under threat, it would be Helsinki before Stockholm, uh, in my opinion. But uh, And w whether so Swedes eventually join NATO or not, uh, NATO will treat it as if uh, that is that, that it's an attack on NATO. Whether they're 
officially in NATO or not, any attack against Finland or Sweden would be considered to be uh, an attack on NATO by, uh, by the NATO people. Uh, you're likely to see continued disruption in Moldova, however. And Moldova is a country which actually has Russian troops on the ground there uh, and has had since World War II. Uh, and Moldova is in a very key position um, because it's not very far from Odessa. And if the Russians have, uh, want to have some kind of a pincer movement that takes Odessa, if they're ever able to do that, come across the south, which was their original plan, and cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea, Moldova would be very critical. So I would look for trouble in Moldova um, before I look forward in Estonia. But should any NATO country be in trouble, it's Estonia and the Estonian, uh, anytime you hear a statement from the Estonian uh, prime minister or any other official in Estonia, they understand that totally. And the Lithuanians as well. Okay, we'll move on. If you want to ask a question, raise the hand under apps because that we can see and it puts you in order. Paul Arnold is next. Uh -huh. I'm mute. I got it. Um, I kind of agree with you regarding Xi. I think he's as strong as, as, as ever right now. Yeah, they love him. <coughs> he's, he's brought up the standard of living so far that they're going to continue to love them until things really go haywire. And I don't think they're going to at the moment. Regarding Putin, he's very strong right now. He's gotten rid of all these people that were against him when they left to, because they didn't want to fight that war. Those are people that would have stood on, on the front lines against him. So we've gotten rid of those people. Um, he, so according to you, it's the right wing that might take him down. I'm not sure if they're not just a bunch of voices out there, and you said that yourself, you're not sure either. I don't uh, know. No, uh, no one knows, because um, you don't know what's going on there. But um, I, I see him as very strong right now. I mean, they've gotten rid of any liberal, quote, taints that they had, including newspapers, people, whatever. And he's solid right now. Now, it does seem as though if this war were to continue badly, which I'm not sure what it's, what's happening there right now, um, it would eventually go against him. But right now, I think he's solid. I hate, much as I hate to say that. I, I hope I'm wrong and you're right. How's that? <laughs> well, I, I, don't I would right say, right. yeah, I'm not sure that people love Xi Jinping. Uh, he's, uh, it's gonna be all deal with economics, particularly yeah. from the middle class. They've had improvements in their lifestyle then that stalled out with the pandemic and the zero COVID. And if he does, if he can't give it back to them, and if they all of a sudden are starting to have uh, problems affording the things that they think they want, uh, then we then he could he could be seeing some uh, seismic waves there. As far as Putin is concerned, uh, his his opponents from the left have gone. Yes. Uh, we don't know how strong, and it's not just uh, Prigozhin. Prigozhin and Kadyrov both have private armies. Uh, and Gazprom has just announced that they're putting together a private army in order to protect the routes to uh, the, uh, the, the routes across the top of Europe uh, towards, uh, through the ice. Uh, so you see on Russian TV and some of the commentators that uh, are very pro-war and everything begin, have been speaking out about how they think the war is, uh, it, is being badly run. So if Putin is, if this offensive that is being bandied about that the Russians are about to have an offensive, or if they're, uh, if that doesn't pan out well, or if the Ukrainian offensive is successful in any way. Those guys from the right, uh, they'll go after Shoigu and Gerasimov first. But if they if they go after Shoigu and Gerasimov, that will be an attack on Putin, and that will be something you want to watch very carefully. Uh, if they if they fall, then 
Putin has got some problems. Okay, next, Anton. Um, yes, um, uh, I'm wondering about the, the Chinese uh, peace plan. I can envision um, Eastern Ukraine, Donbass, et cetera, becoming kind of a, a DMZ, uh, maybe administered by the UN or, or not. Uh, but, but what do you think would happen with uh, Crimea? <clears throat> well, uh, Tom, the peace plan, to start off with what, however the war ends, assuming it, it ends at some point, there will be a border. And on each side of the border will be a, a nation that is deeply fearful or deeply angry at the person that's on the opposite side. You know, whether that border is uh, the original Russian-Ukrainian border, whether it's uh, the Dnipro River, wh whatever it is, it, there's going to be border issues. Uh, I don't think the UN will be called in. Well, they might, but uh, remember that both China and Russia have vetoes in the Security Council. So uh, the uh, West is not likely to be welcoming in the UN to prepare patrol it. Uh, I don't know how, if, if they come up with some kind of a, a negotiated settlement, I don't know who would enforce it. That would be a very good question. And I don't know uh, I mean, how you were going to per persuade the Ukrainians to accept it, unless you say, okay, either you accept it or we cut off all your uh, assistance. Uh, because the Ukrainians are saying they want every inch back we're already saying uh okay yeah it's good uh go after the donbass uh see if you can uh, get uh, some of zaporizhia back that they took but uh, let's not get too uh, interested in going after crimea because that would be a major operation and we're not so sure that that's a very good uh, idea militarily so we're trying to discourage that taking place. Uh, how a settlement comes about, uh, what the Chinese peace plan will contain, what the response will be to it, I don't know. I do know, the only thing I do know is that to say, uh, as long as it takes, or we're steadfastly behind you, is a very dangerous thing to say because I'm not sure that the thought has gone into it that, to say, we're really prepared to do that, that we can really deliver on that. And the Ukrainians may be soaking it up and saying, you know, they're, they're, we're, they're not going to abandon us. But the Chinese are going to challenge us, and it's going to be soon. Antonio. I still, uh, again, thank you very much for the lecture. Appreciate it. Uh, question, kind of two-pronged. Um, do you have any idea about uh, whether or not the Chinese have uh, weapons-grade chips? Uh, can they fabricate their own? And secondly, if they do, would they share weaponry with such ch chips to the Russians? Well, Tony, uh, the, we, the Chinese have made a gamble. We've made a gamble. Well, we cut them off. Oh, I have three o'clock rich. High grade chips. <clears throat> off of the high grade chips. We challenged them to say uh, their their China 2025 plan, which was to become self sufficient. How is the music? Uh, key elements that uh, dealt with their national right. security. That they would never be able to make chips, uh, high quality chips of the kind that are produced by Taiwan Semiconductor. That they wouldn't be able to do that. We took that gamble. The Chinese have gambled that they that they will be able to do that. Uh, so that is an unsettled question. That's for high quality chips for sophisticated weaponry, such as uh, the most sophisticated jets and and there's other things. The lower quality chips that go into tanks uh, and other weaponry, uh, the Chinese do make and. It's, Chinese actually make more semiconductors, uh, processors, 
than we do. Uh, so uh, they they have plenty of chips. If the Russians are pulling chips out of washing machines in order to stick them in their missile, the Chinese can provide them with chips that are equally uh, powerful to that. Uh, that's not something we want to see happen because that is one of the things that's kept uh, the Russians from uh, increasing their ammunition. And I don't know the answer to whether the Chinese are prepared to do that. I do suspect that uh, while they may not send the Russians tanks, they might send them chips. That might happen. Or the Chinese might send the chips to somewhere uh, as a middleman and let the, that, uh, the, that country send them, like the North Koreans, for example, who've already been supplying the Russians. Anybody else have any questions? I do. Where are please Elizabeth? Okay. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Okay, I'm going to ask a very, very, very extreme question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you think there's any possibility somewhere something secret could be going on? Like Israel does sometimes. I'm not saying Israel, but uh, maybe working with the military or something that Putin could be assassinated. No. Uh, well, that's what we let's suspect. It. Nobody is more concerned about that than he is. There's a rumor, and and CNN uh, had videos of it. There's a rumor that he will not fly in airplanes anymore because he can. They can be tracked very easily, and they aren't very. Uh, they they're not very armored that he travels everywhere in an armored train that is fully armored, pulled by three locomotives. Uh, they, and it has advanced uh, um, communications equipment on it. And uh, CNN has, you can go online and look at it. They've had taken pictures of it, uh, of, the, of that train. Uh, so there's a rumor that he's doing that. Uh, he's got his own private army of 40,000 troops that he's not letting go to uh, the to, to Ukraine. Uh, so let's I- say, Let's say someday he dies or the war is over. Is there any chance that he ever will be strung up like Mussolini at the end of World War II for all these terrible crimes that he's accused of and has done? No. No. Well, I mean, if, uh, as I say, the, the most likely replacement for Putin now are people who are more aggressive. Uh, if, if Putin, he's not going to just be deposed. If Putin is out, he's dead. That's the way things go in Russia. Uh, but I don't think uh, you mentioned uh, Israel, uh, who has the most experienced and, and uh, and, and deadly assassins in the world. Uh, I don't think that even uh, Mossad would would take the the job of trying to assassinate Putin. So I don't know. Uh, I, I'm guessing that that's a fairly remote possibility. I thought so too, but I I, 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 I lot and all kinds of people so. Kelly, you want to answer? You want to ask something? No, I I want to just run another point by you. Uh, in order for the United States to uh, maintain a commanding role and power that it is, it needs to have a strong economy, and uh, the the prospect of two nations one who's the largest supplier is the United States uh, that they sell to, and the other is China, which is the largest entity we buy our goods from, and our wealth is, is, is uh, built by consumption, and consumption would tank unless this <laughs> economic scenario has a uh, an answer that it doesn't have today 
Oh, Shelly, I would just say that if you, anybody who inspects the trade between China and the United States as to who gives what to whom both ways, uh, it, it would lead you to the, to the conclusion that decoupling is basically insanity. Right. But uh, we're not being necessarily on either side uh, governed by people who are rational. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Yes. Yes, I see. Erica? No. I guess yes. it's not Erica, but Mr. Beasley? Yes, that's right, Jack Beasley. Um, just a question, Stu. <laughs> First of all, thanks for a terrific presentation. Um, but one of the things that uh, kept coming through my mind was what, what role, if any, does the DPRK play in all these talks and considerations, it, because I think if you talk about somebody that's very unstable, uh, this is where human error could could cause us to enter into a, uh, a very uh, bad situation, especially with their nuclear capabilities. Yeah, well, the DPRK, uh, Kim Jong-un, and now appears to be grooming his daughter to take over eventually. Uh, uh, he, they want to be noticed. They want to be regarded as a, a world power, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So when they are, when attention is diverted from them, they go a little crazy and start firing off missiles everywhere. Um, and although they serve a purpose for China, which is a, being a buffer state um, with uh, South Korea, and uh, not having a South Korea or Western oriented uh, country right up next to their border, uh, they're, you're, they're kind of a, a loose cannon down there in mm -hmm. North Korea and the Chinese can't really control them all that well. Uh, so they're, uh, who knows what, what Kim Jong-un is likely to do. Uh, so uh, he's, upset with South Korea every time we have a any kind of a, a joint maneuver he's upset with Japan that's why he's been firing missiles to show that he can hit Japan whenever they want uh, anytime uh, they, they talk crazy but since 1950 they really haven't done too many things that are crazy is Kim Jong-un capable of doing something crazy yes of course Mm -hmm. uh, and so they fire up some missile, missiles and hits something that uh, is Western oriented is certainly a possibility. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese can't control them and we can't figure them out. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't even talk to them. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> any, <clears throat> any other questions that people have out there? Well, you know, I guess for Elizabeth, I think, has one. She's raising her hand. That's another crazy question. Uh, should we go back and look at the history of King uh, Tut there in Egypt? What's the point of this nine-year-old? What? Uh, King, that... uh, President Un, his daughter. Yeah. Nine-year-old. Who's well, just a percentage of the world. How well, does that he... work? He's making her, it looks like, and nobody knows what's going on, but it looks like he's planning to make her his successor and bring her up as a successor the way he was brought up as a successor. Uh, people have theorized that Kim Jong-un got some kind of fatal disease, is uh, what's going on. His other, uh, the other person who steps in for him and uh, when he needs to be when he is either incapacitated or unable is his sister, who may be more rational than he, but far tougher than he is. Uh, so that's the ruling clique of the Kim family is opaque. Well, it beats me. <laughs> but just remember King Tut uh, didn't live very long. Yeah, but didn't he die of a disease? No, he died, but he was hit over the head. 
Oh, good idea. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, now that we've covered Egyptian history, uh, <laughs> uh, is there anything else anybody wants to uh, ask or state? Well, I just would like to state oh, look, that I see I see Don down there. I didn't think there was anybody else. I hope I'm on. You know, I'm unmuted. Um, as you have already pointed out, it is very frustrating uh, for uh, the Russians to be launching missiles and uh, getting uh, columns of in, uh, tanks and everything inside Russia. And with uh, the uh, Ukrainians not being able to fire back, it makes it all by itself a strange war. I can't think of, um, uh, there probably are other wars where something like that's happened, but I can't think of one. Uh, is, I, I presumed if uh, Biden were to, uh, what he would call escalate, I guess. Uh, I'm willing, perfectly willing to take a chance on the Russians not being foolhardy enough to use tactical nuclear weapons. Um, it is a bit scary, but you have to be. I mean, uh, it's, it's like Cuban, Cuban missiles crisis when they were eyeball to eyeball, you know, somebody's got a blink. Um, couldn't uh, Biden, uh, provide whatever long range equipment uh, the Ukrainians are seeking with promises on the part of Zelensky uh, not to do this, that, and the other with them. Of, of course we could, Don. I mean, we started off, we could have given them stuff right from the beginning, but we give it, we, our policy has been, no, we're not going to give you this uh, then all of a sudden after a little then we give you the high mars okay but we're not going to give you the one that is the longer range than the high mars then we say okay well we'll give you one of, we're going to send you some of those but we're not going to give you air defense equipment the patriots we give them that when we had the thing with the abrams tanks now we're so it all could happen all of that uh, could happen it would have been nice if we give them it all in the beginning a, a lot earlier, but that could certainly happen. But were we to give them, and what we're concerned about is if you give them long range weapons so they can attack Russia from Ukraine, then that will escalate, will basically be at war with the Russians. Uh, now that may or may not be the case, but that's what the fear is. Certainly we could provide it. The Pentagon is urging, or most military people urging, that you give them all this equipment and 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 take that risk. Uh, so far, we have not been prepared to do that, but it could happen uh, if if Russia gets attacked. The biggest fear that I would have would not be nuclear weapons; would be that the Chinese might get involved. Then you then you'd really be dealing with a completely different situation. So, Stu, you seem to be saying that China doesn't want to let Russia lose, but they're not going to help them win either. Well, what <clears throat> what do you define as win? I don't that's, know. That's, <laughs> Whatever. That's, that's I mean, the question. They're trying, trying to do a peace plan. And it, it sounds like it's going to be one of those that favors Russia. Anything that gives Russia more land, one could define as winning because they went in trying to retrain, get some land. Right. So their peace plan is, is it going to be all of the four entities that the Russians uh, brought into their country and declared that they were Russian? Uh, you know. Donbass, the two two provinces in Donbass, uh, Crimea, Zaporizhia, uh, Kherson. Uh, are they going to say all of those are Russia, and therefore we should have a peace agreement based on that? Are they going to say 
Uh, the peace agreement should all of the land that the Russians occupy right now should stay Russian, and and, uh, and then we we declare that the peace agreement being that would it be uh, go back and say all right the, the the land in which the way it was when before the Russians invaded on February 23rd last year <laughs> is that going to be the peace agreement we don't know. What would you any like? Of those, any of those would be considered Putin could claim victory if any of those went through. Yes, he could. And Zelensky would claim that it was a catastrophic defeat. So that's where we are. Almost surely, whatever the Chinese propose is going to require the Ukrainians to give up land. And they say that they they don't want to. They're they're absolutely against doing that. But we'll see. That's how negotiations take place. But we haven't seen the Chinese peace plan. My guess is it won't be long before we do see it. Any other questions anyone has? Elizabeth's got another question. What up? Yep, you. <laughs> Me, Elizabeth? Yeah. I just want to say that from the very beginning, I felt very strongly about this peace deal giving to Ukraine. It seems to me it makes us go one step forward and two steps back. And we're shooting our own selves in the foot for the demise of democracy, which is not only in our own Congress, a fear, but all over the globe. And it's, to me, that's very important versus autocracy. So I don't understand why we don't give them the things they need and get it over with and let them be closer to victory earlier. What is the point of this? Okay, we'll give it to you now, but last week we wouldn't give it to you. That's a good question, Elizabeth. I'm going to have Shelly, I'm going to send Shelly an airplane ticket to Washington, D.C., and you can go down there and, uh, and ask them that question because that's a very good question. Well, I'm glad it was a good one. I don't know what he answers any more than anybody else. So. Sad. Anybody else have any questions or comments or anything? Well, we want to thank you very much for uh, an informative lecture. You've done it again. Uh, we're fortunate to have you among in Academy for Lifelong Learning. So thank you very much to Diane. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Okay. Bye, Bye, -bye. Stu. Oh. I'd just like to ask you to give a later class someday. <laughs> a what? A later class. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> One third time. Uh, thanks, thanks, Stu. Very good. Very good advice. lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Stu. Does he know so much anyway? <laughs>